All right, everyone. It looks like uh, we're a little after three o'clock, so I want to uh, to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Peter Isaacson, and I'm a land manager here at People's Company. I would like to welcome you to our Big Questions and Land Management webinar. Uh, today, we have a number of industry experts who will be discussing uh, topics including National Weather Outlook, U.S. and Global Agricultural Economy Outlook, estate taxes and passive versus active income, and finally, technology and precision agriculture. Um, I'm excited to hear from our high quality speakers and feel these topics are timely and hopefully useful when considering your operational goals. Uh, I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about People's Company and the services that we offer. Um, so those, for those of you who don't know, People's Company is a full service land transaction provider offering land brokerage, land management, land investment, and land appraisal services. We have licensed professionals in over 30 states and operate offices in all major agricultural hubs throughout the United States. Uh, currently, we're operating offices in Walla Walla, Washington, San Diego, and Fresno, California, Jonesboro, Arkansas, Arlington, Tennessee, Marlette, Michigan, Omaha, Nebraska, and DeWitt, Indianola, and Clive, Iowa. Our team is comprised of 120 industry-leading experts across the country who find and create innovative real estate solutions for our clients. Today, we'll be focusing on topics relevant to our land management division. And for more information on our other divisions, uh, feel free to visit our website at peoplescompany.com. Uh, just a brief overview of our land management strategy. Uh, our approach focuses on long-term appreciation and sustainability of each asset on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, this approach embraces whole farm practices and income versus the traditional management model of intensifying income on productive acres with a focus on short-term returns. Uh, our model identifies progressive operators that are aligned with the landowner's long-term goals and objectives. The operator that fits this model doesn't require constant production oversight and utilizes the best practices to increase overall productivity. Uh, our base services include capital improvement projects, conservation assessments, USDA compliance and certification, fertility and yield documentation, custom farm operations, and aerial images of each farm. We also try to identify unproductive or environmentally sensitive acres and manage in a more sustainable way through better practices. Uh, <clears throat> our model delivers two reports to our clients, including an annual business plan, which documents the previous year's on-farm data and an annual summer report, which highlights the current crop and growing conditions throughout the summer months. We also offer full service accounting for our clients and deliver quarterly financial reports. Um, just briefly touching on a new initiative uh, that People's Company is involved with uh, that started last year. We became the first professional land management company to adhere to the 13 principles of the Leading Harvest Sustainability Initiative. Uh, and currently, 100% of our acres are managed under this standard. Uh, this standard serves to measure sustainable agricultural practices in a way that is flexible and meaningful for diverse soil types, crops, farming practices, and uh, ideally this standard and these principles can be implemented around the globe. Uh, it also ensures the public that their food, fiber, and fuel is being produced in a responsible manner with a commitment to long-term sustainability. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Leading Harvest, you can visit their website at leadingharvest.org. And uh, without further delay, we're ready for today's speaking lineup. Uh, before we begin, if you have any questions, you can type those in the comments section uh, and we'll either get to those at the end or as the speakers finish up, uh, you guys are more than welcome to go in and address those, uh, those comments via uh, typed reply. So without further ado, let me introduce our uh, first speaker, John Homanek, who will be discussing uh, the National Weather Outlook. So John is a meteorologist and the owner of Empire Weather Consulting. Uh, Empire Weather has been a leader in agriculture and energy weather forecasting since 2017 and provides consulting and decision support for thousands of clients around the globe. John has also founded the New York Metro Weather, a blog and media company that works to provide easily digestible weather forecast to the public. Uh, John, thanks for being with us today. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll let you take 
Thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. Uh, pleasure to be here today. Um, as mentioned, my name is John Homnick. Uh, I'm a meteorologist and the owner of Empire Weather Consulting. So very excited to provide the national weather outlook for everyone today. Going to review just a little bit about our forecasting process and where we stand on a national level in terms of the weather. Now that includes things such as where we have drought or wetness, where the temperatures have been warm or cool, um, and the big factors that are driving the weather pattern, not only just in, in North America, but across the globe, because it's all connected, as you guys know. Um, Empire Weather Consulting uh, is a full service weather consulting company. Um, and so uh, we will break down exactly how we conduct our weather forecast. So the first thing to discuss is, is how we get to the process of putting together a weather forecast, obviously such an important factor in agriculture uh, across the country. And it all starts with analyzing the current conditions. We need to know uh, where we are before we figure out where we're going to go. Um, and so a lot of our time is spent analyzing current conditions. And that also includes not just what's going on nationally, but across the globe. So how are things behaving uh, with the El Nino or the La Nina? What's going on in the stratosphere? Uh, without the getting into the technical stuff, it's all connected. It's all part of one moving part. Um, we also try to compile analog years and days. So what can we take based on what happened in the past to, to put into our forecast moving forward. We can learn from what has happened before. Uh, and all of that comes together to create a weighted forecast before we ever even look at weather models. Uh, weather models can be fickle. They're only as helpful if you understand what they're trying to tell you. So uh, we have a very detailed forecast process that goes into uh, the, the past and what's going on today before we ever look at weather models at all. We wanted to start by taking a look at what's going on nationally uh, and globally in terms of uh, the sea surface temperatures. As you guys are well aware, this impacts us uh, in so many different ways, uh, but particularly when it comes to the La Nina, which is a major, major factor, a driving factor in the weather pattern. So uh, we see that the La Nina is still going. I circled this for you here. These blues, uh, these below normal temperature anomalies, they tell you that the trade winds are still strong in the equatorial Pacific. And that tells us that the La Nina is still controlling the weather pattern across uh, the globe. You can see that this all feeds back into the pattern across the North Pacific. We have much warmer than normal waters in the Pacific Ocean into the Gulf of Alaska here and along the West Coast of the United States. And so this is a classic La Nina looking pattern. Uh, this is the third year that we're gonna go into the fall and winter talking about the possibility of La Nina being in control. In fact, it does look like it's in control and it has been in control for quite some time. If we look at weather models moving forward here, the trends from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology tell us that this week La Nina is going to continue. There really is not much support for it to weaken at least into the fall months. Um, and uh, for multiple reasons, that's a very impactful part of the forecast. The so La Nina is really in the driver's seat when it comes to the weather uh, over the next couple of months. And it looks like it's going to be very similar to where we were last year in terms of the strength and intensity of this La Nina moving forward. So what was the pattern like this summer? This is a just a snapshot and it's sort of an arbitrary image, but it, it I chose it because it really depicts where the weather pattern was over the summer. So we're looking at the 500 millibar map, a couple thousand feet above our heads. Um, and we're looking at the anomalies in the height. So the, the oranges and reds tell you that those heights are higher than normal. And, and what we see here is a ridge that's centered over the four corners of the United States. And so that has kept a lot of the heat centered in the plains, the Southern plains, the central plains here up from Texas into Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska. Um, and it's also kept a lot of the Eastern agriculture regions. So Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee away from that heat. In addition, what happens on the edges of these ridges is you get storm complexes coming down. And so the weather pattern has been more active than normal across parts of the Great Lakes, across the Ohio Valley, and even into the Northeast. This has been the area where we've seen a lot of warmth and heat. The Southern Plains have really taken the brunt of this pattern because of the position of this ridge uh, over the last several months. And you can see that reflected in the latest drought monitor. This is uh, as of August 16th. The drought monitor is released every Thursday uh, at eight o'clock in the morning. So this is the most recent one that we have. And you can see over the summer, we've really built up quite a deficit across the Southern Plains. It's well drier than normal, really from uh, Southern Texas into Oklahoma, Western Kansas and Nebraska. Uh, but you can also notice it's, it's expanding into parts of Nebraska as well as parts of Iowa and even a sliver here into Indiana and Illinois. The worst of it though, definitely here in the Southern Plains. We've also seen drought expanding continuing here in the Western United States 
and some additional areas in the Northeast that have also seen expanding drought uh, over the last couple of weeks. So overall, not a pretty picture, especially in the Southern Plains here uh, as we move into the middle of August. We can also look at soil moisture maps and the wetness percentile of the soil to tell us where the driest conditions have been. This graphic is again valid as of August 15th. We get the new graphic here uh, later today, but you can really see where it's been drier than normal recently in the root zone uh, soil moisture map. And this tells us here in parts of Nebraska and parts of Iowa, it's been well drier than normal. And that also extends further north into parts of the Dakotas, Montana and Idaho. Meanwhile, we've seen improvements across the Great Lakes, across parts of the Ohio Valley, into the Mississippi Valley, uh, and even down into the Arlatex region here, where the last several weeks have brought repeated chances for moisture in that area. Here's the last 90 days of precipitation. So this is going to show us the percentage of normal precipitation. And you can see why that soil is wetter now across the central and eastern agriculture belt regions. There's been above normal precipitation over the last 90 days in these regions. And so I think it's important to note, 90 days is a pretty long time frame. You know, that's three months worth of above normal precipitation in this area. Um, and you can really visualize that with the greens and blues here, showing that many areas are 150 to 200% of normal precipitation. But also, as we move further west, you can see it dry out a bit. Areas such as Iowa, eastern Nebraska, and then down into the southern plains, Oklahoma and Kansas are, are more spotty in terms of that precipitation. And we've seen largely those drought conditions continue. Another thing that sticks out here is the active monsoon. It's been a very active monsoon season across the four corners. Precipitation is well above normal there. And all that moisture has made its way further north. So check out the fact that in the last 90 days, it's actually wetter than normal in parts of Wyoming and Montana, as well as in the Pacific Northwest. So quite a dynamic weather pattern in place here across a large majority of the United States uh, with the eastern part of the agriculture belt really benefiting uh, with the moisture over the last 90 days. Here are the areas uh, that are in drought relating to the key agriculture region. So these are the corn areas in drought from USDA. Uh, so the green areas are showing you the minor and major crop regions and the red shaded uh, hatched area is showing you where the drought uh, has been designated by USDA. And so it becomes very clear here that the western part of the corn belt is the area that has been a concern that remains in drought. The eastern part of the belt is doing much better uh, than the western and southwestern part. And the drought extends down, obviously, further south into the southern plains. The same can be said for soybeans. So this is the uh, soybean areas in drought, 24%. And you can see very clearly the vast majority of that is across the central and western belt. This area has missed out on important rains over the last several weeks, and that is starting to manifest itself with that drought building. Meanwhile, uh, in the central and eastern belt, much of those areas have avoided drought and have actually picked up quite a bit of moisture recently. Here's an overview going back to look at July. I know we're well into August now, but uh, you can see that in addition to getting that moisture in the central and eastern belt, we actually kept temperatures near or slightly below normal in parts of the Great Lakes. All of that heat, the big heat at least, four to five or greater degrees above normal for the month was centered in the southern plains into the Arlatex region. And then of course, the Pacific Northwest, at least a couple degrees above normal in this area. Temperatures have consistently uh, remained above normal in that area here during the month of July. And if we look at August so far, the map obviously a little less detailed as we don't have the full month of data yet, but it's kind of, you know, much of the same. Warmer than normal in the Pacific Northwest and the Northwestern Plains, continued warmth in the Southern Plains uh, and cooler than normal in the Great Lakes down into the Ohio Valley uh, and the Mississippi River Valley as well. Here's the simulated pattern for the month of September. The first thing that will probably strike you is that it doesn't look all that different than what we've experienced. We had a temporary respite from this pattern in the last week where we saw lots of moisture move into the Southern Plains, but we're largely expecting to go back to the pattern that we were in before as we move into September. It's expected that models will start to trend warmer with temperatures for the month of September, and we should also see opportunities for storms. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, during this chat that the uh, ridge was centered in the Four Corners region during the summer so far. That's where it is again on models during the middle of September. We still have a Gulf of Alaska low here, which is a classic signal uh, for an active storm track into the agriculture belt. So we're likely looking at warmer than normal temperatures again in the Pacific Northwest, uh, as well as into parts of the agriculture regions. And this trough here, you can see the storm track keeping things active uh, in the Northern Plains and the Great Lakes. There should at least be opportunities for those showers and storms moving forward. For the Southern Plains, unfortunately, 
This means we'll likely start to see a trend back towards warmer uh, and more active conditions as we move into September. So here's the next 30 days of temperatures on the latest European weeklies model. You can see exactly what we just discussed. Lots of warmth here in the Pacific Northwest, even the Western Canadian prairies. Uh, and then we have that warmth starting to reemerge right back into the Northern Plains and the Great Lakes and the Northeast, while cooler temperatures linger a bit across the Southern Plains with that active monsoon season just continuing um, and keeping things moving along down there. We should see this warmth begin to reemerge on models, especially the second half of September here uh, in the Southern Plains. From a precipitation perspective, when we look at the forecast models, um, it's likely going to be more active than indicated, but we will see chances for precipitation across the Northern Plains, Great Lakes, Ohio Valley. Um, and then obviously this signal here, very, very wet and active for the Southern Plains. Can't stress enough, that's likely going to shut off as we move into September. Obviously, there's a lot of concern about that when it comes to harvest. And the, and the feeling is, backing up to this graphic, feeling is that we're going to start to see warmer trends in that region. Um, this is likely uh, a little bit of a bias from what's going on right now. These models tend to uh, be biased based on the initial condition. And so I think while there will be some moisture and it will be active across the ag belt, we'll likely see things dry out and warm out, uh, warm up a bit in the Southern Plains. Last thing I want to talk about is tropical activity and the pattern in general. So bear with me a bit on this graphic. I'm going to explain it uh, as, as simply as I can. So we're looking at the dates here on the left. They go from the top to the bottom. So we start up here in August and we end in October. And then the bottom, we're looking at the equator. So here's South America. Here's Mexico. Here's where North America would be if the map were to continue. So this is the Pacific Ocean. And the blues and greens on this chart signify rising upward air. Uh, and the reds and uh, yellows and oranges signify sinking air, downward air. So when you have rising air, you encourage thunderstorm activity. And when you have sinking air, you discourage it. What you want to see is this moving from left to right, almost diagonally across the graph. And what you see on this map is simply a standing wave. It's not moving anywhere. So the pattern is fairly stagnant. And we're not expecting much change on this pattern into September. That's what's guiding that warmer forecast. Uh, there's nothing moving this, these thunderstorms across the Pacific Ocean to get things really going. And the last thing I want to talk about, obviously, it's been a very quiet tropical season so far. Look at all this, this orange and red in the Atlantic Ocean here. We've had a lot of sinking air that have, has really suppressed tropical activity. But as we move into the second week of September, mid to late September, look at how this starts to change a bit. You start to get some whites and some greens. That's the model saying, hey, the atmosphere is waking up a little bit across the Atlantic. And there could actually be an environment that fosters the development uh, of these tropical systems. So uh, we have an inkling that we'll probably see an uptick in tropical activity as we move through the next couple of days uh, on models. And especially as we move into the middle part of September, we're likely not through with this yet. I know the season has been very quiet, um, but it would be unwise uh, to look away at this point. I think that there's still quite a bit of activity ahead of us and the opportunities may begin to emerge by the time we move into the middle part of September uh, and then, of course, obviously into October as well. So that is an overview of uh, what's going on nationally in terms of weather. It's been a pleasure uh, to be able to present this to you guys. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I'll hand it back over uh, for our next presenter at this point. Thank you, guys. Thank you uh, for that presentation. And um, yeah, it seems like we always have uh, <clears throat> dry weather going in through the summer months and then harvest, it, uh, it, it catches back up with us. So thank you, John. And we've certainly dealt with our fair share of volatility over the past couple of years. Um, our next uh, speaker, we have Stephen Nichols from Rabobank presenting about the U.S. and global agriculture economy outlook. Uh, Steve is a Rabobank geo global sector strategist and has more than 30 years of experience in cash grain markets, hedging commodity ingredient procurement, and um, a, a native of Iowa, Steve holds bachelor's in farm operations and agriculture education and a master's in agriculture and economics with uh, all those degrees from Iowa State University. So I will uh, I'll hand it over to you, Steve. There we go. Get it in the right order here. There we go. Can you hear me? 
So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank to People's Company for having me today. And uh, we've got a lot of material to go through, so I'm going to go through this fast. So please put questions in the chat if you'd like to uh, ask questions, but there's a lot going on. So I'm just going to jump right in and talk just briefly for those of you not familiar with Rival Bank. Uh, we are a food and agriculture bank around the globe. Uh, we have both uh, agribusiness and rural franchises uh, across the globe, primarily in North America, South America, and Australia, uh, and in the Netherlands, which is where we're headquartered. Uh, we have grain oilseed, I have grain oilseed colleagues uh, across the globe, as you can see them there on the map. And I get a chance to reach out to them every single day, which is extremely helpful to understand what's happening uh, on a day to day basis. So. Uh, I've worked for multinationals before, but never had the experience to be able to reach out to people literally 24 seven. So, but so let's jump in. And I wanna just uh, kind of, we're gonna start with a macro view as to what's going on and what, what are some of the things we see and some of the concerns we have uh, going forward. But one of the things that, and I could spend, I could spend my time just on this particular slide, but one of the things, and I'll let you read through some of these, I've never been at a time in my career, other than maybe the farm crisis 1980s, where there has been so many moving parts within agriculture. Um, and, and the thing that's even more interesting or more uh, unsettling sometimes is that these, these issues are happening at a faster and past, faster pace on every single day. You know, they might happen a week or a, over a period of month or even a quarter, but now it seems like if we, by the end of, by the end of our conversation today, some of these things have already changed. And we've certainly noticed that when we look at geopolitical issues and what's happening uh, is across, uh, across Russia and Ukraine today. But you can see there's a lot there and we'll talk about some of these along the way. Not to, I don't wanna spend much time here, but I just, um, cause John did a great job of, of laying out the weather situation. But one of the things that I found, and John, I'd love to talk to you about this, is I look back at the, at the drought monitor over the last 10 years at this time period, at this very period of time. And you look back to the, all the way back to 2012 drought, and there wasn't a time other than 15 that we saw the Corn Belt relatively drought free. And that was a bit of an eye opener for me to think about that mother nature has really had an impact on us, uh, on our weather and on our crops and what we're doing. And I'll come to that in just a minute. The other thing I just want to present to you, and this is a, this is looking at the major grain companies and their sustainability, climate change, regenerative ag, whatever, uh, carbon zero, greenhouse gas uh, goals they put. One thing I want to say about, I'm learning more about this and my views are evolving as we look at this, but I will tell you one thing is that companies, whether it's grain companies, whether it's food companies, whether it's oil companies have set these very ambitious goals in the next five to 10 years, and they all, a lot of them revert back to agriculture making changes. And it's like they're on two different two different tracks where these goals are happening in the next five to 10 years. Agriculture is plodding behind. I don't mean that in a, in a, in a derogatory term, but the fact is we plant one crop per year for the most part. And so we can't make changes as fast as maybe companies could make. But I think there's a lot going on here. And I think a lot, a lot of discussion needs to happen here between all of us about where we go from here and how do, how do we make uh, our agriculture more resilient as we go th for a, through a period of very difficult weather sometimes. So let's kind of start to kind of come back and peel and look at the fundamentals. If you look at, this is a graph of corn, wheat, soy, and rice stocks around the globe. And you look at that and think, why are prices where they are today? Because we're in the top 10% of all time stocks and you're kind of left scratching your head going, why are we here? You see stocks to use ratio for this are above average. Um, over a, a long period of time. And so it's a little bit of puzzling of why are we here today? But if you look at, and I apologize, this is busy, but let me describe this. This is the stocks of the major exporters of corn, wheat, soybeans, and rice. And when you look at corn, soybeans, and wheat, you could see that we are on a multiple year drop or decline in stocks. And you look at wheat and you can see that they're holding you know, a different variants of this, but the exporters, if the exporters don't have it, that means that that's not going to get into the world market. When you look at wheat, China's holding 50% of those stocks. So that's a really, uh, you know, difficult situation. One of the reasons you're starting to see much support for, for products or, you know, for these crops around the world from a price perspective. But you look at rice and you go, we've had declining stocks, but from very high levels, 
But when you look at the exporters, India is holding up 80 to 90% of those stocks. And we know India's history of a, a ban on wheat exports. And you don't suspect that India is going to let any rice out of the country as well. If you look at a global set for rice, India is holding about 20% of the world's stocks. So when you peel the onion one more back, you see that we have declining stocks of the major crops among the major exporters, which means those we just don't have these crops in the world available for everybody, and they can dwindle very quickly. Same sort of picture in the United States. You see stocks down. We see them at, you know continue to decline. Corn, wheat, soybeans, all have been on a multiple-year decline, and we have to keep that in mind as we go forward. Also, you look at the U.S. You look at the stocks to use ratio, particularly with corn and soybeans. We're back to the levels or below the levels we were back in 06, 07, 07, 08 time period when we saw the last big spike in prices. And so I would give you, this is a very clear sign that supply is not keeping up demand. And there's lots of reasons for that. And John has laid out that very well. One of those reasons is certainly Mother Nature has not been favorable. And we'll come back to that a little bit as I talk about yield. So one of the things that we have looked at when we look at our 10-year baseline, and this is based in the U.S., but I'm going to look at global. When you look at the area harvested for these crops, it is not is not it is not increasing very much. It's being it's actually sort of we're slowing down that growth, and I would argue to you we're pretty stable going forward, which is not what we want to see. And if you divide that up by regions, when you look at you know look at the EU, look at the FSU, the 12 countries of the FSU, former Soviet Union. North America, Oceania, primarily Australia, the only place you see expansion is in South America, primarily Brazil. I would, I would caution you, and I, I, one of our concerns going forward is that we don't see that Brazil could be getting a situation where they're, not, they're unable to make any more expansions of acres. Certainly, the rainforest gets a lot of attention, but you see the amount of pasture being put into cropland. And at some point, someone's, some importer is going to say, I'm not going to import whether it's soybeans or cotton, whether it's corn from Brazil, because it's quoted deemed not sustainable. Is you can't continue this expansion and you're harming the environment. So I want to just point that out to you that we're not seeing, you know, the expansion of global area is going to be a challenge going forward. And if you look at the U.S., it's a very similar story, if maybe more uh, more stable in the U.S. You can see corn hovering to basically around 90 million acres. You see beans a little bit of an arch, and I'll come to reason why we're seeing an increase in soybean acres. Um, and then you see wheat uh, basically has kind of peaked out and is on its way downward, and cotton is flat as well. So soybeans are winning that battle, but you can see we don't see much expansion here in the United States, and this is from our 10-year baseline. But if you look at this on a longer period of time, we, you know, the peak was back in 1991, and we haven't even come close to that anytime soon. And you can see that's not going to happen this year, and it's certainly not going to happen as we look at our model going forward. Um, basically, a lot of the expansion in soybeans is coming at the expense of wheat. Um, and you think about where wheat is in the world and the demand for wheat and the price for wheat, that's a little startling, but you'll, I'll come back to why soybeans are seeing that. But again, not to beat this dead horse, but the fact is you look at principal crop acres, they've been on a long-term decline for a long time and we don't see that changing. Now, some people will say, well, that's because of, of uh, CRP. That is some truth to that, but there's only about 20 million acres left in CRP at this point. And we saw 1.8 million acres of that come back this year. And we still didn't see much of an increase in total, total crop acres. So keep that in mind that the CRP is not a panacea for more acres. So we have a situation in the world where we have dwindling stocks or very low stocks. We don't seem to have more arable land in the world. So you think, okay, well, the yields must be going up to make this. And that's basically true. We do see yields going up and that's the good news. But if you look at this on a, and we look at this a global and I'll come back and look at the US, you can see the last 10 years have been relatively flat. Go back to the weather situation. Technology has helped us survive with fairly good yields, but it has slowed the growth down. We don't see that yield potential growing or the annual growth happening as strong as it was over the past several years. And if you look at the US, same situation. The good news is on, and I'll give you an example on corn, the good news, corn is increasing 1.8 to two bushels per year, although that's slowing down. The bad news, it's only increasing 1.8 to two bushels per year. We're not seeing an increase. And so for the world to continue to grow production and to feed people and to provide the grain for the world, 
we need to see the investment in technology, whether it's genetics, whether it's cultural practices, whether it's in soil health, that has to, we have to see that to go forward here. We've had a lot of questions about, and the market has certainly gotten a lot more concerned about recessions and thinking, oh my goodness, we're gonna have, you know, this is gonna hurt the market and we've seen markets pull back from that. But as you look over time, and this is looking at total use of corn, soybeans, and wheat in the United States, you can see that recessions have sort of a mixed bag. Sometimes they do have an impact on demand, other times they don't. Um, and you can see, but at the same time, after that recession or in the next year, you see the, the market come back very quickly or the use come back very quickly. I would argue to you that most of that seems to come from price. And when you look at price, this is a corn chart, monthly corn chart laid over, the US recessions are laid over it. You can see we've seen some declines, the biggest decline being you know, during COVID and then also during 08, 09. But you can see how quickly the markets came back and sprung back from those recessions and came back to the price levels they were, you know, before that recession started. And here I've laid over, you know, U.S. corn use, uh, all the different, you know, feed and residual, FSI, ethanol, laid that over uh, price, over price. And you can see that price does seem to have more impact on whether we see a demand pullback or not. The interesting thing this year, when you look at, when you look at the last several years, we've seen this increase in corn, we haven't seen much of a pullback in, in, in price. And, and part of that is because the demand curve has moved, moved up to the right and price, I, I hate to say it this way, but has become less material. Countries in the world have to have food to feed people and they're willing to pay the price to make sure they get it. Just a couple things and Peoples is a, certainly the expert on farmland values. But one of the things that I wanna focus on the bottom left-hand chart is that I looked at gross corn revenues in Iowa versus farmland values. And there's a, a pretty good correlation and helps you particularly on the, as we move up and down, has a pretty good correlation as to what's happening in corn in, with land prices. Land prices, of course, are very high right now. Um, and we do expect to see an, uh, an increase in 22, uh, as we'll get, these are Iowa State numbers, by the way. Um, we do expect to see an increase in 22. Certainly will not be the 29% increase we saw in 21, but the fact is it does look like that land prices will be continuing to go up just at a slower rate from what we've seen in the past. Just one other uh, question or just one other comment about margins. We do expect, uh, while gross revenues will go up, we do expect to see corn, uh, particularly U.S. corn farmers, and this is Iowa State numbers again, to see production numbers uh, or margins come down for the corn and soybean producers. We do expect at 23, it's going to be very close as whether it's a break even year or whether we do see some negative margins across the country. We do see margins start to spring back a little bit in 24, but again, the more at a break even sort of, uh, at a more of a break even going forward. But we do expect, as we doss on 21, and it's all we see here in 22, good margin for, for farmers, and farmers seem to be doing a good job of managing that cash flow and keeping some money back for a rainy day and making wise investments to improve the efficiency of their operations. As you might suspect, we've had a lot of questions about Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it certainly has shaken the world. It's certainly shaken commodity markets. But I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, the Russian grain agreement, um, and then as the map here shows where before the agreement, where Ukraine was shipping, you know, north into the Black Sea or into, into Germany, into Poland, um, into, into the Germany area, and then south down the Danube quarter to the port of Constano, Constanza there in the Western Black Sea. You know, I will say I've been astonished and pleasingly astonished that the grain agreement has been working so far. We have seen upwards of, of uh, 60, up to upwards of 30 ships or shipments out of the Black Sea. Uh, and we do expect uh, that Russian, Ukraine is target wanting to get to four, four and a half million metric tons a month. I think that's pretty ambitious. They are shipping upwards of over a million metric tons a month on 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 uh, on their pace right now. So I think it's that's been the good news. I I always remind myself we are shipping within a war zone. You have countries in this agreement who don't get along um, at all, and. Who knows, you know, an errant bomb here or there could just turn this on its air. But I think the one on its ear very quickly. But I would one thing remind you is we do see tremendous volatility in prices, and we think that will continue as we go forward. Here you can see just the history of Ukraine exports up into the war and how they have dropped off dramatically here in the last four months. 
Uh, we will start to get July and August numbers here very quickly. Uh, these, this is out of a consulting firm that we that we talk to and speak with regularly uh, out of the Ukraine, Russian area, the Black Sea region. So we think these are pretty good numbers as we go forward. But as we go forward, as I said, and, you know, we this has been a good thing. Uh, we do expect um, the pace will pick up because it's important for Ukraine to move that crop out, both because it's going out of condition fast, they don't have the technology we have in our storage bins, and also need to make space for the new crop that's coming in. Surprisingly, they got 4.6 million hectares of corn planted, typically they do 5.5 million hectares. So we see uh, amazing work they've done to get to move crop, get crops planted and move crop out. So um, watch this very closely. I, one thing I will just touch on quickly for the volatility, just to give you an indication, on Friday last week, Zelensky and Erdogan of Turkey met. Uh, the media was all abuzz that this was Erdogan was going to provide a, negoti a negotiated uh, proposal to uh, Zelensky from Putin. Uh, the media, and so we we quickly saw wheat prices drop seven percent. When you, Zelensky came back and said no, next day says we're not going to do that until troops are out of Ukraine and the market came back 5% almost instantaneously. So it gives you a, a, a sense of how volatile this market is and just news from day to day could it's really moved this market back and forth. But some things I think that we have to think about when we think about the war, it's gonna have a long tail, like a drought has a long tail. This has changed the way people are gonna do business. Where the Black Sea was cheap wheat, it was people thought, I'll take that cheap wheat, this is a good deal, but buyers got caught with being flat-footed and not being multi-sourced. So buyers are making changes very quickly, but it's also going to encourage investment in other parts of the world, particularly that Danube corridor through Hungary, through Romania, Bulgaria. It's going to invest, it's also going to put R&D investment in other regions for production. How do we increase production in other regions? How do we make sure that we don't get caught like this before? Do we potentially see investment production, investment in fertilizer outside the, outside the, the Black Sea region? and also in non-petroleum sort of fertilizers. What do we do to go forward? So this is gonna spur change and also spur investment uh, globally. Can't, uh, let me finish up here and talk a little bit about corn and talk about soybeans. Uh, an economist has a hard time not coming up with a little bit of outlook going forward. So, but I don't want to, I wanted to show you this sort of dashboard. So you're looking at stocks, to, you're looking at Indian stocks of corn versus the farm gate price, look at stocks to use ratio versus price, and then the change in stocks versus price. But you can see that stocks are at, at lower levels. You can see the stocks use ratio at lower levels and we're not up, have the ability to, to build stocks. One thing I would tell you looking at, when we look at history and look at how this goes, it is going to be a time, it's gonna take us two to three years to build stocks back to, to get the, the equilibrium price back to areas that are not quite as high as where prices are today. And this, this is across corn, wheat, and soybeans both here in the United States and across the globe. Here's the demand curve. And I want to just show you this, and I don't want to be too nerdy here, but when you look at 1980-81 into the mid-2000s, that demand curve was relatively flat or inelastic. It didn't really matter what the price is. We were going to take what we needed. Um, it was just depending on what we needed that year. And price could go up, we'd still take about the same amount. Price go down, we'd take about the same amount. But as we move past the mid 2000s you saw that demand curve move up and to the right. It also got a little more elastic. And so what that tells you, and it goes back to the price volatility, any or slight change in demand or demand uh, quantity demanded has a bigger price impact. And so you get bigger moves to the upside, bigger moves to the downside, and more volatile moves if you see a change in demand. So keep that in mind. And this is true for, I looked at this for a mill of the major crops, and we saw the same sort of phenomena which is what we've seen is much more price volatility over the last decade than we've seen in the previous decade. Ethanol has been a winner this year. You know, we're up about 6.5% on the corn grind. We expect that to go, expect that to be, stay strong relatively over the next several years. But on the horizon, of course, there is going to be some clouds for ethanol. But one of the, one of the things that we're going to look in as we go into the new year is look at sustainable aviation fuel. This could be a, a game changer for ethanol in the sense of, as we see a reduction in liquid fuel for vehicles, for you and my passenger cars and trucks, 
we could see ethanol a new opportunity and there has been testing by both Delta and United for both ethanol SAF and also biodiesel SAF going forward. So that's something to be watching going forward. It's not gonna happen because we have higher blends, it's gonna happen because we have new technology and new uses for the fuel. And this is the other pieces of this is we see a, we do see growth this year and that's not a surprise if you've done any traveling this summer but we do see over time you can see that that gasoline supplied to the u.s market continues to decline you know it's not at the at the levels we had in the past several years you can see in that red bar it's down the red line is where we have it's below where we've been in past years it's not at the peak so this is um this is our outlook from our our 10-year baseline we're updating that right now as we've got new numbers from USDA on the supply side. But you can see the corn acres, 75% probability is how to read this, that we're going to be under 91 million acres over the next 10 years. When you look at prices, 75% probably will be under six and a quarter. And we do see a, a decline in prices in the, in the back half of this forecast. But one thing I will tell you, when you look at those lines, we see a lot of volatility there. And that uh, the spread in those lines, as tall as there, a lot of volatility in corn prices. Just as a just to kind of as a, an aha that we had, the brown line, which is 90% probability, is basically a drought scenario. And we had when we ran this iterations, about 500 iterations, we did see some $10 corn, but that was under a drought scenario. So you can see there's a lot of volatility and a lot of upside risk from where we are today in our view. So let's talk about soybeans. I think this is a really a market that's changing things very, very quickly. So as you look at this, you can see the stocks and I see a, a mistake there I have to work on, but you can see a very similar sort of page as we had, you know, low stocks for soybeans, low stocks to use ratio, a very difficult time building stocks. Um, so we see prices for soybeans being very high, but the soybean market is a little bit different, a little bit changing. So you look at acres, you see 75% probably corn or the soybean acres will be under 93 and a half million acres. Now, as you recall, you know, that was that number for corn was about 91 million acres. So you can see that soybean acres are gonna, are gonna be, are gonna eclipse corn acres over the first five years of this period. And then we kind of see them kind of come back together. And I'll come back to that, why that's happening. Look at soybean prices, very similar. Next five years, we're gonna see relatively higher prices. And then we start to see them normalize or come back to a more normal area, but still, 75 per trial by they'll be under 1475. So again, as and I will tell you, as we've looked at our 10-year baseline over the last three years, each year that that price range moves up to about a 50 moves up about 50 cents to 75 cents a bushel. And that's on corn and on soybeans. And so you can see this progression of higher prices over the last several years. I just want you to I want you to remember this chart as I go forward. Crush margin, it's good to be a soybean crusher, and you can see the crush margins are good. And when you look at soybean crush over the last 10 years, it's grown, it's grown at a compound growth of over 2%. And you look at corn wheat, it's only grown about half a percent. So there's there's volume and there's growth there that why we've seen the demand and the growth in soybean crushing. And you can see that now, the red line is soybean, monthly soybean crushing, you can see it's the top of those lines, it's top of the heap. And so with that, we have seen a, a quiet, I say $4.5 billion investment in the United States soybean crushing assets. It's going to increase soybean crushing 650 million bushels over the next four to five years. Think about those acres. Why are the acres going up in the next four to five years? This is why it's happening. And you can see most of this is what I would call the Western to Northwestern Corn Belt. There is some in, the, in Iowa, in the Northern parts of Iowa, but we, we believe a lot of these, all these plants will be built doesn't mean we won't see some of the older plants mothballed down the road, but the fact is you can see there's a major investment coming in U.S. crushing assets. It's about a 30% increase from trend, from trend crush, and you can see that in this chart going forward, and that's, again, why you see the higher prices of soybeans, and you also see the higher acreage going forward. And you might ask, well, so what does that mean for price? And you can see the orange line for soybeans is before we added capacity and we put the capacity in there, you can see nearly a $2 per bushel increase in soybean prices. And your next question will be, what does that do to corn prices? Corn prices raise as well. It's, you know, all boats are floated by good news. And also the fact is it's keeping up with the Joneses. Corn can't see too many acres of soybean. So it's got to keep its prices up to also keep, keep at least keep the acres it has going forward and not lose 
excuse me, any more acres to soybeans than it, than it has to. And, and why is this happening? It's low carbon fuel standard. You see the demand for renewable diesel, which is different than biodiesel. And you can see that in this chart over the last 12 months, how we've seen an increase um, of biofuels or from the biofuel sector, primary renewable diesel for, re for feedstock, which is primary vegetable oil and fats. Year to date, we're up 30% 30 30 versus a year ago. And, in and that was above a year ago when we started to really pay attention and really get the data to see what this is doing. So the increase in, in the good margins, the increase in growth in soybeans, and the increase in the demand for biofuels, primarily renewable diesel, is driving that demand for vegetable oils um, across the North American continent. Also tell you just um, parenthetically, we see over about a about a two billion uh, a two billion Canadian dollar investment in canola crushing facilities in Canada because of the demand from the renewable diesel sector. So with that, I'm going to stop. Um, my contact information is there, and for the lawyers uh, that are telling us that what I just told that you told are telling you that I'm an idiot, so don't listen to what I say. So with that, I will turn it back to Peter, and thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you, Steve. Uh, definitely, definitely a lot of things that uh, are on the horizon and it'll be, you know, we'll just have to take them as they come. But uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dwayne Vandercroll, who will be representing and uh, presenting on estate taxes and passive versus active income. Uh, Dwayne Vandercroll is an attorney at Nine Master Good. Uh, before joining Nine Master, he spent 15 years with an international public accounting firm and today he assists clients with tax issues associated with major business transactions such as mergers, acquisitions, expansions, and reorganizations. Uh, he helps businesses with tax issues involved in structuring deals, negotiating stock and asset transfer agreements, drafting operating agreements and other govern governance documents, and participating in tax credit and incentive programs. He also represents clients in tax controversies and disputes advising corporations and individuals being audited by the IRS, the Iowa Department of Revenue, and other taxing authorities. Uh, welcome, Dwayne, and uh, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate the introduction, presentation here. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present today. As uh, Peter said, I'm a tax attorney with the Nyamaster Good Law Firm. We have offices uh, only in Iowa, but we're in Des Moines, Cedar Rapids, and Ames. As Peter alluded to, my practice is about um, one half transactional, everything from large mergers and acquisitions to smaller one-off type deals. The other half of my practice then is representing uh, clients uh, before the Internal Revenue Service, State taxing authorities, and I also do some property tax work in front of local local property tax assessors. My presentation today is going to be um, really two separate topics: one, uh, estate and gift tax update, and then second, a topic on um, pa passive activity losses. Um, so the first one is estate and gift tax update, and this actually is an area that I don't practice in, but the good folks at People's Company wanted me to give a quick update, so I got the chance to talk to one of my colleagues who does practice in this area and ask them what, what they've been up to. And the answer I got is that they're busy right now using up, uh, helping clients to utilize their lifetime exemptions. And what's that mean? The, the exemption uh, for, for this purpose means assets that can be given away during lifetime without, or at death, without incurring a gift or estate tax. That lifetime exemption is currently set pretty high. Right now it's 12 million per person and because of the ability for spouses to port or otherwise transfer the exemption between each other, um, right now, a married couple could shelter up to $24 million um, from uh, estate and gift taxes. However, and that, that's obviously a large number. However, that number is set if, if Congress um, doesn't act to decrease to approximately 6.2 million by the end of 2025. So the goal is how can uh, taxpayers with net worths in excess of those amounts utilize their entire current uh, lifetime exemption before that sunset occurs in 2025. 
Now, there's a couple of keys to this. Is that first, you, um, they must utilize the entire $12 million now. Anything less than $12 million that isn't given away, isn't transferred, um, now could potentially be lost by the end of 2025. And also to do this, you know, the, the transferor must give up control of the assets. So those two issues can be difficult for um, certain individuals uh, to, to, get, to get over. But one alternative, and what our state planners have been busy with, is what's referred to as a Spousal Lifetime Access Trust. Uh, the acronym is a SLAT, which actually to me sounds like something on the floor of a hog confinement, but that's the acronym that, that's used here for, for purposes of this trust. Um, so how does the SLAT work? First off, it's funded um, by a gift of assets, um, equal, you know, up to $12 million for, per, for this purpose, if they have that much in assets and have that much exemption to use from one spouse to the other. The beneficiary spouse, the spouse receiving that gift may receive distributions during his or her lifetime from that trust. And finally, the trust is not eligible for the marital deduction for gift tax purposes, which is what you want, because that means then that those assets will not be included in the spouse's estate when he or she passes away and those assets pass to the next generation or other beneficiaries. So this can be a, a, a palatable solution for those individuals who aren't quite ready to give up complete control or at least willing to give control of those assets and the utilization of those assets to their, to their spouse. However, there's a huge key here and that if um, both spouses want to do this. So we'd be talking about um, individuals with net worths in excess of 24 million would like to do something, um, uh, would like to utilize a SLAT. Um, those trusts cannot be considered reciprocal trusts. One way to avoid the treatment of reciprocal trusts is for those trusts to be established at separate times. And the greater the amount of time between setting up those trusts, the better in order to withstand challenge from the Internal Revenue Service. So you can see um, we're starting to run out of time. The, the sunset by the end of 2025 will occur here in just over two years. So to the extent this is something, uh, an estate tax planning opportunity that you or clients want to utilize, um, no time like the present to, to get started um, with, with this, with setting this up. Okay, so moving off of estate and gift tax updates to um, the presentation on passive activity losses. Um, I'm gonna go through a number of questions, gonna go through these quickly, so I apologize. Um, but here's the questions we're gonna to answer today on passive activity losses. First, why is it important to understand the passive activity loss rules? Who is subject to the passive activity loss rules? What is an activity? What's the definition of activity for purposes of these rules? When is an activity a passive activity? And finally, how are the passive activity loss rules applied? So first, why are these important? Why do we need to know these? So the key here is that losses from passive activities cannot be used to shelter income or tax liabilities from non-passive activities. So a few things we need to unpack there, a few definitions. Um, key, what's a passive activity and what's a non-passive activity? Let's we'll start with a non-passive activity. So a non-passive activity is an activity in which a taxpayer materially participates. And we're gonna to get to that definition. But think of things like compensation, wages, or businesses in which the taxpayer is um, regularly and substantially involved. The other category of non-passive activities is portfolio income. So income um, from say like interest, dividends, and other investments like such as that. Passive activities then are, are, the, are the flip side. Those are activities in which the taxpayer does not materially participate. And again, we're gonna get to that in a bit. But here's a simple example. So my taxpayer in this example has income from non-passive activities of $100. So that could be wages, could be from a business in which they actively participate, or it could be say interest income. They also have losses then from a passive activity. So an activity in which they do not materially participate. So arguably this taxpayer on an, from an economic standpoint is broken even for this tax year. However, as I set up above, the key here is that losses from those passive activities cannot be offset against income from non-passive activities. So my $100 of losses are suspended. I get zero deduction for that in this tax year. And my hypothetical taxpayer ends up paying tax on $100. So our goal, and what we're going to talk about is how can we prevent that um, result going forward? 
So who's subject to these rules before we get into that? Um, individuals, by that I mean natural persons, trusts, estates, personal service corporations, think of law firms, accounting firms, those that the shareholders um, perform personal services, closely held corporations, generally defined as greater than 50% ownership by five or fewer individuals during the last half of the year. So this is who is subject to the passive activity loss rules. Um, the, law, the rules apply to um, activities which these taxpayers may hold directly, but where this generally comes up is um, ownership through flow through activities or pass, I'm sorry, through pass through entities, such as partnerships, limited liability companies that are taxed as partnerships and subchapter S corporations. Who is not subject to the passive activity loss rules in general, not most subchapter C corporations, other than, as I mentioned before, personal service corporations and closely held corporations that are taxed as subchapter C corporations. So let's talk about what is a separate activity. We're talking about the passive activity loss rule. So what's an activity for, for this purpose? Activity um, for, um, in the code is kind of used in two separate contexts. First, it generally refers to the smallest non-divisible unit of operation. So think maybe here of a taxpayer that owns several farms throughout the Midwest. Each farm would be considered an activity um, for purposes of the passive activity loss rules. However, the term activity is also um, used to refer to a grouping of what the IRS refers to as the appropriate economic units. So a taxpayer could group, in my example, those farms into certain larger activities if, it made, if it's reasonable and if um, it makes sense from a tax perspective. So let's talk about that. Again, the IRS's um, test here is that a taxpayer may use any reasonable method to group activities. Some of the considerations here are similarities and differences in the types of activities, whether they're under common control, uh, you know, common management, common ownership. Another big one is geographical location. And finally, maybe the biggest one is interdependencies between the activities. Let's talk about an example here. And this example comes right from the IRS's regulations. The IRS um, refers to a taxpayer that owns a, a bakery in Baltimore, a movie theater in Baltimore, a bakery in Philadelphia and a movie theater in Philadelphia. And the conclusion the IRS says is that these could be grouped any one of four different ways. Um, each of those could be considered its own activity for purposes of passive activity loss rules, or they could all be grouped into one activity. All four of those smaller activities could be grouped into one larger activity, or depending on the facts and circumstances, geographical location could come into play and the two Baltimore activities could be grouped together, or potentially the two bakery and the two movie theater activities. So four different ways that all could be considered reasonable just based upon the applicable facts and circumstances. So the goal here though, when doing this grouping is to avoid the passive losses, which as we're gonna talk about in a bit, um, under the test uh, is based upon the amount of time that um, the taxpayer spends on each activity. So we, we'll, we'll talk about that here in a bit. Um, the one thing to note though, and this is key, is that no matter um, how interdependent they might be, rental and non-rental activities generally cannot be grouped for purposes of the passive activity loss rules. And that's because we'll talk about this, rental are considered to be per se passive activities. So when is an activity passive? The definition of passive activity, as I mentioned off the start, is an activity in which the taxpayer does not quote unquote materially participate. So that's a definition the IRS and its regulations provide a number of tests for purposes of determining material participation. And those tests are, I'm gonna go through these very quickly. One, the taxpayer spends more than 500 hours um, participating in the activity. And note that each one of these tests is an annual test. So this determination is done year by year. And these hours and, and um, amount of time participating is not prorated. So it doesn't matter if it's a seasonal activity. It doesn't matter if it's an activity that started a new activity, maybe started late in the year. In order to be um, a, not a passive activity, a non-passive activity, it has to meet one of these tests. So again, more than 500 hours of participation, um, which is obviously quite a bit of participation activity, roughly 10 hours a week. Um, the taxpayer provides substantially all of the participation in that particular activity, so no one else um, provides any material amount of participation. 
Um, the taxpayer participates for more than 100 hours and more than any other individual in that particular activity. Um, the, the taxpayer is involved in what are referred to as significant participation activities. So think of a taxpayer that uh, may own a number of different businesses. If they um, provide services for more than 100 hours in each and for more than 500 in total in all of the significant participation activities that he or she owns, they'll be considered to be non-passive or to maturely participate in all of the activities. The taxpayer has maturely participated in the activity for five of the last 10 taxable years. Um, a few others here, material participation in a personal service activity for any three prior years. So once, um, the, once the mature participation has been, at any, been met in any three years going forward, that will always be considered a, a non-passive activity. And then last is sort of the catch-all. If, if the taxpayer regularly, continuously, and substantially uh, at, uh, performs the activities, and this is kind of a facts and circumstances test. Um, hopefully the goal would be to meet one of the more bright line tests um, based upon specific number of hours. But if necessary, if you can't meet any other tests, you can make the argument based upon that last kind of catch all uh, seventh uh, facts and circumstances test. All right, so more about when an activity is passive. Um, rental activities are, are key, as I mentioned off the start. This is where we'll spend a lot of time and I have a lot of uh, clients that, that end up with, with issues dealing with rental activities. Rental activities are per se passive activities. What I mean by per se is that um, no matter how much time is spent in that rental activity, it's going to be considered passive and therefore any losses from those rental activities cannot be utilized to offset income from other activities. Now, one um, situation that comes up quite frequently when dealing with um, farm with, with landowners is um, cash rent versus crop share arrangements. And there's a lot of nuances that go into these tests, and this has been subject of quite a bit of debate in various areas of taxation, including passive activity losses, as well as self-employment income, and now the, the net investment income tax. Um, but as a general statement, uh, a general rule, cash rent is always going to be considered a rental activity and therefore a passive activity. So any losses from a cash rent arrangement cannot be utilized against other sources of non-passive income. Crop share though is, is a little bit different. Crop share is generally for the IRS considered a joint venture, not necessarily a rental activity. So crop share isn't per se considered to be passive because it's not necessarily a rental activity. And so if you have a crop share arrangement in place, now we look to those general material participation tests. So if, if the crop share landlord is not materially participating in the arrangement, it's considered to be a passive activity. And generally that's on form um, 4835 for those of you who are tax return preparers. Um, however, if that landlord is materially participating in the crop share arrangement, it's considered to be a non-passive activity and those losses can be utilized. Another special rule for retired farmers, disabled farmers, and surviving spouses of farmers is that the activity can be considered non-passive if the farmer materially participated in five out of the eight years preceding his retirement, uh, his or her retirement, his or her um, disablement, or, or his or her death. And that just applies to farmers. So in the farming situation, you can add that particular test to the previous seven. Lastly, there's an um, exclusion for taxpayers that actively participate in rental real, real estate activities that can um, deduct up to 25,000 of losses. However, that does phase out for taxpayers with income between 100 and 150,000. So how are these rules applied? Um, unutilized passive activity losses from one year are carried forward and can be used against future passive income, either from that particular passive activity that generated the losses or from other passive activities that the taxpayer may have. The other time then where suspended passive activity losses can be offset is in the year of disposition of that passive activity. So any suspended passive activity loss carry forwards um, in the year of disposition, and that's either of all of the activity or of substantially all of the activity. And that year, those are freed up and can be offset against other sources of non-passive income. Finally, a couple related issues that in the interest of time, I won't spend time on, but note net investment income tax, of, it's a 3.8% tax, generally applies to passive income. So when you're grouping your activities or doing planning around passive activity losses, you need to take into account that 3.8% tax that will apply to any income from those passive losses. 
And finally, an issue that comes up with farmers um, that are selling their properties um, for Iowa, and this is an Iowa tax issue, there's a capital gain deduction that does look to those material participation tests that I referred to earlier. So with that, I'm gonna hold off. I know questions will be asked at the end. So with that, I will say thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to, to present today. Thank you, Dwayne. Yeah, that uh, <clears throat> those are those are tough uh, questions that I normally just refer them to people like you for uh, when speaking with clients. So glad uh, we have resources like yourself. But uh, without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce our last speakers, Ben and Kent, who will be presenting together on technology and precision agriculture. Uh, ben Crockett is the director of strategy and business development for Advanced Agrolytics. Ben has a passion for developing and executing business strategies that combine the human element and data analytics and an insatiable focus on creating value for the customer. Most recently, Ben managed a portfolio of farmland assets for Farmland Reserve with a focus on the Great Lakes and Corn Belt regions while also leading evaluation and acquisitions of farmland as an asset class. He and his wife are the proud parents of six children and raise cattle on their farm in Indiana. Ben earned his bachelor's degree in economics from Brigham Young University and an MBA from Purdue. Speaking along with Ben is Kent Kling Klingabel, who grew up on his family's farm in North Central Iowa, raising corn, soybeans, and swine. His passion for precision agriculture led him to his role as a lead agronomist with Advanced Agrolytics. He backs up that passion for precision with nearly two decades of experience providing agronomic solutions to growers in the form of seed, fertilizer, and crop protection inputs along with precision technologies. He is a certified crop advisor as well as a two-time graduate of Iowa State University earning both his bachelor's and master's degrees. So with that, I will turn it over to you guys and uh, let you guys finish out our day before questions. Hey, thank you so much, Peter. Uh, great to be with everybody, and, and thanks, John, Steve, and Duane, for your presentations. Kent and I are honored that People's Company asked us to, to present today. Uh, the presentation that, that we've prepared today really stemmed around this question. Should technology and precision ag be a big question in land management? And I hope as we wrap up today that you will feel like you've got some insight into this and, and how it applies to your roles. A little bit about us first, though, Advanced Agrolytics has a broad and connected team with hundreds of years of combined agronomic and development experience. We've got about 135, and we put a plus employees because we're growing. Of those, about 60 are what we refer to as precision agronomists and field specialists with a laser focus really across the Corn Belt, so from the Missouri River to the Ohio Valley. And we've got uh, more than 500 growers that, that are part of our team. We have three business models that we focus on that are all synergistic. We've got our primary business model where we're working directly with growers on their farms as an integrated part of their operation. We also have a research arm of our business where we're researching new technologies uh, as well as seed and, and other crop inputs. And then we've got a second uh, or a third pillar of the business that's strategic partners. That could include land management companies, farm management organizations and others that, uh, that we partner with. When you think about what we offer, uh, we'll come back to this slide later, but really you can bucket it into prescriptive recommendations and additional services. The prescriptive recommendations is really uh, where we're building with software and technology, the most comprehensive set of variable rate recommendations. But that is augmented, and again, we'll talk about more with additional services that are primarily those boots on the ground. Somebody there with growers day in and day out. So there's three points as we jump into these last 15 minutes. There's three points that Kent and I wanted to cover. I'll cover the first, Kent will cover the second, and then I'll close with the third. The first one being that there are significant opportunities that exist to reduce the variation we see in agronomic capacity and productivity. The second one is that we believe that we can build more climate resilience and further reduce that variability as we characterize the environments of a field isolate the mechanisms within those environments and reinforce with yield. And we'll talk about that. And we'll close with technology and precision agriculture can also reduce the, the variability in agronomic capacity of every acre when it's augmented with boots on the ground and continuous improvement. So let's jump into this. Significant opportunities exist. So is there variation? This field here 
uh, could be played out just about anywhere in the Midwest. If you look to the north, you see field B. To the south, you see field A. And if we isolate these fields, and depending on your screen today, watching the webinar and the coloring, hopefully you can see this. But if you look to the north, there's a visual difference between these fields. Now, having spent time in, in acquisitions, when I look at, let's say, field B, let's assume that I was going to, to do some due diligence or present this back to a client, probably one of the key things I would have looked at was soil type. And so as you look at this image and say, okay, there's two fields right next to each other. They've had or seen the same weather pattern. They've got very similar soil, and yet you're seeing significant differences in, in this case, in appearance of crop health. Now, look at this another way. Um, soil type represents only a fraction of the variability that we see across fields. And we see this play out also. These numbers seem large, but we see this consistently in the same areas. We'll have two fields next to each other, two different growers. And one of those growers is achieving a 50 to 70 bushel delta versus the other grower on corn a $250 to $350 difference in gross revenue. In beans, we'll oftentimes see a 20 to 35 bushel delta. Same area, different growers, different practices. So when you think of that first point, does variation exist? Does it exist beyond soil types? Absolutely. So Kent will jump in and talk about this next point. It was interesting earlier, Steve talked about this a little bit, but we can build more climate resilience and further reduce variability as we characterize the environments of a field, isolate mechanism, and reinforce for yield, really getting that report card for a farm. Now, if, if you can see my screen here, every farm that you work with or maybe you farm today has a water-limited acre, a nominal acre, and a saturated acre. It doesn't matter how the difference is on that farm. It could be really hilly. It could be a flat field in central Illinois and central Iowa, or you could be clear into, you know, southern Iowa and into Missouri and some of them rolling fields. But every field can be characterized this way. So if you think about this first picture, I myself as a retail agronomist for a long time in my career, we all manage farms on a flat piece of paper. And if we think about this square 160, today we probably flat rate apply nitrogen. We flat right apply phosphorus and potassium. We flat right apply seed, and we expect a improved result. But realistically, that farm looks like this next graphic. That farm has a lot of role. There's increase and decrease. There's higher areas of elevation. So if we look at the LIDAR, so we're using LIDAR to look at that farm and see the true differences on that field. Now think about this as, as a farm manager and an agronomist or a farmer and how the water moves in that field. If I get a five inch rainfall, let's say, something that maybe we received this spring, I get one to two inches of rain maybe on the top of the hill, and I might get six to seven inches of rain on the bottom of that hill. That's a huge difference. And so I start to characterize that field from a water limited to stable or saturated acre. And so one example that we talk about at Advanced Agrolytics is diffusion. So that's a mechanism. And so diffusion, water limited acre. So if you think about soil fertility, Nutrients are absorbed into a plant root through diffusion. Well, that takes water. And water in a water-limited acre is a lot more limited, obviously. And so I need to have a higher concentration of nutrients in a water-limited acre. And I want everybody that's listening right now, this is different than what the industry discusses today. And for the past 20 years, this is why Precision Ag really hasn't delivered. We weren't looking at farms this way. I was never taught in my career that a water limited acre actually needs more fertilizer and more nitrogen to produce a better result. And so that's a totally different approach. And so that's what's fun about what we do at Advanced Agrolytics is talking through the differences and how we can change things. But as everyone looks at their farms and you guys work through your farms this fall, you're gonna have probably a report that says, I need to soil sample these farms. So the fundamental soil testing is still crucial. It's how we understand the fields and understanding how we're soil testing by environment gives us insight into the soil properties that allow us to manage these environments and influence mechanisms that drive yield. Organic matter and cation exchange capacity, plus other nutrients, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, zinc are all critical. Now, if you think about organic matter for a second, how many farms have you maybe purchased or helped sell, or how many farms have you used organic matter percentage to determine how much nitrogen you'll apply in that next season. Organic matter is critical. 
in everything we do. And it's just another thing that we're thinking about. So when you look at and you prescribe and you order your soil test this fall, the left is a standard two and a half industry group, right? Same thing. I did this for 15 years of my career. This was the standard, a two and a half acre grid, 4.4s, 10 acre grids, zones, really not providing that insight that we need. So if you think about just moving those points around, it's the same cost. But if your agronomist truly looks at it and moves those points around inside that field and puts them in the right spot, we can truly start to measure those environments. And if you start to think about variable nitrogen, seeding, P and K, and managing each environment inside of that, truly important in what we're doing right here. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into fertilizer. I just replaced what I took off. I've worked with a lot of growers in my career that I'm just gonna put back whatever I took off. I'm gonna take my yield map or I'm gonna set a flat rate yield goal. Maybe it's 220 bushel corn I combined. I'm gonna flat rate apply that fertilizer this fall. Here's a yield removal prescription. So I want you to think about that 150 pound rate as we jump to the next slide. So now that same field, if I look at the left map, soil wetness index, understand where water flows in the field. So how much do we lose or gain from diffusion or mineralization and the environment? Then how much do we need? What is our target yield goal? And so we have a K critical level. We have varying critical levels of potassium in the field. It's not 200 part per million goal on that whole farm. It's different in each environment. And then we take the soil test. So in that area, I have a high soil test. So how much do we really need in that area? Next level. So in that first slide we showed, we would put a lot of fertilizer in that area that we pulled off a lot of corn. But if you actually look at the prescription that it actually needed, I didn't need any fertilizer in area and that spatial location had the least and the most risk for runoff. So we think about conservation, stewardship, all applies to this principle. Start with the environment. I want everybody to take away that. This is the most important thing. As you drive home today, you think about this, or even if you look across your yard, you have different environments in your yard or those farms. If we isolate the mechanism and we reinforce with that ending yield, that's critical in what we're looking at. And this fundamental method applies to nitrogen as well. So we talked about P and K, but if you think about the field that Ben showed earlier in nitrogen management, same thing, we can map nitrogen loss. We can side dress prescription, do all kinds of sorts of things with nitrogen management and all the other key nutrients, they're all fundamental method. So I'll turn it back over to Ben to, uh, to finalize here. So the last point we had as we wrap this up was again, technology and precision ag can reduce the variability uh, in the agronomic capacity or productivity of every acre. But we added to this a really important part when augmented with boots on the ground and continuous improvement. And what do we mean by that? So again, back to this image, right? Field B to the North, field, e to, field A to the South. If you ask yourself, well, what's different between the two fields? Well, there's probably some placement that's different, where those nutrients are put or the seed that was planted in these two different fields, the timing of that, when the grower got out to the field, and then their own practices of continuous improvement. But oftentimes, when we think of the growers, we've acquired an asset, uh, we, we were managing a farm. We oftentimes want to come back with technology that's going to solve everything the easy button technology, downloadable from their iPhone, an app, and it just doesn't work that way. And here's a quote that we've heard and that I've felt many times, we don't have an innovation problem in ag. We have an implementation opportunity. And, and what we mean by that is this, you know, going to a grower with a piece of technology, precision ag, and just saying, hey, we expect you to use this. We're not gonna be there to support you and it will be just fine. And that doesn't work that way. If you look at this statement we put at the bottom, uh, should, and again, I come back to that question, should tech and precision ag be important in land management? Absolutely. But it's cutting edge technology augmented with boots on the ground all season long, year after year. So what does that look like? As we wrap up, what does it look like when technology and precision ag come together with boots on the ground? This screen can, this, this graph may be a little bit confusing. Let me try to explain this as simply as I can. This is a box and whisker plot. On the vertical axis, you've got expected final yield. And on the horizontal axis, you've got testing we've done of the size of a plant. So if you can think of the left-hand side of this, 
it's showing me the size of the plant, in this case corn, at V6. So roughly in the first 45 days of the growing season, it's then showing me the tails of the potential upside yield and the potential downside yield, and that mean at 190 bushels. If you slide to the right, you're looking at a plant that in the first 45 days of that growing season or at V6 has a much higher mean, but a really short tail. And when we ask that question of what does it look like when you take precision ag and technology combined with boots on the ground, we work laser focus with growers to help them to get and build a big factory in that plant in the first 45 days. And what do you get? You get climate resilience. On the right-hand side is a plant that even if the weather doesn't align, whether it's wet or dry, your downside risk might be 240. Your mean at 260. And so when you think of this, in another light, in this, this visual I showed you before, we're combining prescriptive recommendations that are helping us get the right nutrients on every acre with additional services, with, with, with boots on the ground. Again, back to field B and field A. If you look at field B, and this example could apply in many cases, and you look at these visuals on the left, field B, you've got a grower that's growing to 190 bushel goal. And he's using the standard of 1.2 pounds of nitrogen per bushel raised. On field A, you've got a grower, and we see this playing out with growers using technology, raising 260 bushels uh, of corn and using 0.75 pounds of nitrogen per bushel raised. You think of the delta there in gross revenue coming off of the, these farms, it's significant. And you've got, as Kent had mentioned before, sustainability and conservation less nutrients being uh, running off of those farms. So back to the question we started with. Should technology and precision ag be a big question in land management? And this is what we close with. If you have a fiduciary and an environmental responsibility to your clients, then absolutely yes. Uh, it should be very important to you. Thank you for the time. Here's our information. Feel free to reach out to us as we close and have questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ben and Kent. Uh, you know, I think precision agriculture has been a, a buzzword in the farming world for about 20 years. And, you know, it's just as much about uh, maximizing your yield as it is reducing your impact. So, I think as we come to this, this large collide of, um, of sustainability and increasing production with less arable, less arable land, uh, we're really gonna start to see those things come to fruition. So um, <clears throat> I, I threw this slide in here this morning because I, I think it's relevant and uh, I'm just gonna piggyback off what all the experts said uh, today. But um, you know, we're getting a lot of questions about lease terminations, that's, that's a really important time in Iowa, or the last couple of weeks of August is. Uh, so we just want to touch on a couple of things we're looking at. So we're looking at, you know, pretty decent profitability for uh, the 2022 crop year. That's going to vary depending on where you are in the range you receive. You know, we saw the drought maps, Western Corps Belt's pretty dry. Uh, parts of Iowa are pretty dry, but I think overall with crop insurance, and, um, you know, probably marginal yields or maybe above average. Most operations should be in the black ink. Uh, a lot of that, you know, in the fall 2021, we had some pretty good opportunities to lock in lower inputs. And so far through most of 2022, we've had pretty favorable marketing opportunities. Uh, with that being said, you can't sell a crop you didn't produce. Uh, so I think a lot of producers were just restricted by, uh, you know, drought. You, you don't want to oversell uh, this type of market and have to go out and place those bushels uh, if you come up short at harvest. So looking at commodity prices, when I'm thinking about negotiating rents, I'm looking ahead to the 2023 new crop prices, uh, be December for corn, November for soybeans. So uh, you can see my follow or my year out new crop commodity prices in August 2020, August 2021, August 2022. Uh, so you can see we're we're a lot higher than what we have been, but um, as Steve had mentioned and and everybody else in ag has kind of recognized, those higher commodity prices are going to play a pretty important role in making up the margins for the higher inputs. 
And, uh, you know, I always tell producers, be, be cautious of the tail when you come off these areas of, uh, or these um, periods of high commodity prices, it's going to take inputs longer to come down than commodity prices will. And we've got some strength back this week, but uh, we saw a little bit of that last week. Uh, as we look at fertilizer prices, I just mentioned it, but fall of 2021, you could lock in uh, pretty favorable prices compared to what they are now. And producers aren't going to have that opportunity this year. They're going to hit the ground running with um, the prices we saw this spring for fertilizer, and that's going to eat up margins. Uh, now, that's just fertilizer. Seed is, we're probably going to see increases of 15 to 20 percent. Uh, you know, those, those seed companies are kind of passing the buck. It costs them more to produce that seed this year, so they've got to uh, keep their margins where they want them. Uh, chemical, you know, not a lot of prices out on those, probably five to 10%. Uh, so similar to slightly higher. And then we're looking at some of your umbrella expenses, such as labor, diesel, fuel, equipment costs. Those are all trending higher. Uh, so as we talk about rental rates or any changes that you're going to make to your lease for next year, uh, every state's different. But uh, I know here in Iowa, you know, our termination deadline is September 1st. So if you're going to increase your rental rate or, or, you know, maybe take some acres out of production or do something like that, you'll need to get that termination uh, executed or in the mail before September 1st. You can either meet with your operator and get a signature from him uh, or send out a, a, a termination notice via certified mail. Those have to be postmarked one or before September 1st. So important uh, time sensitive date there. And, um, you know, as we talk about rental rates, you can kind of see the supporting data above, but our margins are going to be narrowed by higher input costs and rising interest on borrowed money. And uh, we're just going to see an overall higher uh, cost of production despite higher commodity prices. And I, I really think commodity prices, uh, or I should say not commodity price, rental rates um, remain the same as last year, slightly higher. You know, we're really not increasing that margin by a lot, that profit margin. So it's just going to vary on 2022 production and uh, kind of go on a case by case basis. Uh, so important things to be cognizant of. Uh, hopefully I didn't take up too much time. And now we will uh, move into questions. So uh, I see there were a lot of questions that were submitted before the uh, before this opportunity. So it looked like some of those were answered and uh, I'm gonna dive in. I'll do one question for each speaker and uh, we'll see how much time we have. So John, we will uh, we'll have you on the chopping block first. And uh, the question is, what are the biggest signals you will be watching to identify a shift in a pattern of hot and dry weather in the South and Western United States? <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, I also wanted to say um, great job, everyone, uh, on the presentations. I think this was extremely informative, uh, and I really enjoyed listening to everyone. Um, the, the The question itself is complex. Uh, you know, the, the hot and dry weather in the southern United States, for one thing, has been very much controlled by the La Nina. But there's there's many more pieces that go into that. Uh, the MJO, uh, as Madden Julian oscillation, is another thing that really has a major impact on how the weather evolves. Um, but a simple answer uh, would be to watch for when this La Nina really starts to weaken. Um, we're going on now the, the third year of the La Nina being in control in the driver's seat of this weather pattern. Um, and most models, at least for the next month or two, keep those trade winds going, they, they, they keep the La Nina in control. So we can safely say that at least through October and early November, this La Nina will be in the driver's seat of the weather pattern uh, but as we move into the winter time, and even looking ahead to next spring, uh, we have to watch the subsurface temperature anomalies. We will have to watch how this is evolving to see when this La Nina is going to weaken. It will weaken. Um, these things work in ebbs and flows and ups and downs. And there are some hints at the end of the forecast model range, which is right around into the winter months, that this La Nina will start to weaken. That'll be the first sign for us that uh, we're, we're starting the engines on a change to the pattern where an El Nino will be come back, coming back into play. Um, so we'll, we're going to have to watch very closely over the next couple of months to time that transition out. It's going to be a very complex and difficult forecast uh, for the mid to late winter and next spring um, as this La Nina transitions away into an El Nino. For now, we're still uh, kind of at the mercy of the La Nina, which is in, in control. But the, the key to getting that pattern to change and getting that hot and dry weather away from the, the, the south, the southern plains, 
is going to be watching when that La Nina starts to finally weaken and lose its hold on the pattern. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, it's 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 interesting stuff, and it's you know commodity markets and weather are the two biggest things that impact us, and we have no control over them. So we'll move to our next question uh, for Steve, and um, the question is: Are we one record crop away from three fifty corn and ten dollar beans, or will it take multiple years for uh, supply to catch demand? And I know you touched on this a little bit, but uh, a little more insight probably wouldn't hurt our our producers who are worried about higher input. Sure. No, it's a, it's a good question. Our view is when we look at our when we do our model, when we look at our model, our baseline model, we think it's going to take you know multiple years for us to get back where we get if we go back to three fifty ten dollar beans um, because of that. But it's going to take you know upwards of two to three years to get there. Um, we just don't seem to be able to have the production can't ramp up fast enough. And the fact is one of the things in the model that we talk about and one thing that we've noticed is the demand side is very robust you know it's not it's not going away and so if you have if you have very robust demand and that demand continues to grow which it is we as we showed did uh, it's going to be very difficult to build stocks over time we really don't when we look at the model and the model of course is better in the near term than it's the long term but it really is that's the other pieces we just don't see the stock build up until the latter half of that 10 year out horizon. So uh, yeah, it's going to take multiple years to get there, but mother nature has to cooperate with us as well. Yeah. It seems like we're in times where, you know, knowing your bottom line and taking, taking advantage of marketing opportunities yep. as they come is just, is really important because the volatility uh, we've dealt with the past two years is probably, you know, maybe that's a new normal, but. Uh, no, that's a good reminder. It's about, it's about managing the margin and not necessarily hitting that home run. Yeah. Dwayne, uh, we'll move into a question for you. Um, so the question is, if a client has a manager handle all input decisions and custom farming operations, but retains the grain marketing duties, would that be uh, passive or active? And maybe it just goes back to the hours of uh, hours of service, if you will, but I'll let you touch on that. No, you're exactly right, Peter. And so, you know, it's a good question, a common fact pattern. Uh, but the key point here is that to meet the material participation tests that I talked about during my presentation, a taxpayer has to perform those personally. So in this example, any of the activities that have been delegated to a manager don't get counted towards those hours or other time requirements under the material participation tests. However, in the fact pattern, the um, taxpayer has retained some duties, the green marketing duties. So to the extent that those duties take 500 hours a year, potentially might meet the first test that I talked about, or if they take at least hundred hours and they're more than any other individual, including the farm manager, um, then they might meet the, the, the third test on the list or you know, one of the other tests on the list. So it's just a matter of um, taking a look at, at total time spent by all individuals, including the taxpayer doing the comparisons. And here's where the planning comes into place when you're doing your grouping of activities. Um, to the extent maybe, you know, um, this taxpayer, you know, owns this farm, another farm, you know, the, the, the marketing duties here only take 300 hours a year, but another farm, they take another 300, maybe by grouping those two farms together, now they get over the 500 hour test and it doesn't matter how much time the manager's putting in because they've met just that baseline 500, 500 hour test. So, so that's really where the planning comes into and where taxpayers need to look in their crystal ball a little bit to do their, do their tax planning. So if they have CME pulled up on their second monitor every day at work, that doesn't uh, that doesn't classify. Unfortunately, unless there's that's the only thing they're doing is staring at it all day long. Maybe you can make an argument. But. There we go. Well, we uh, we're kind of getting short on time here. We'll we'll go through as many questions as we can. Uh, we'll get a question for Ben and Kent here, um, and this is a, a question I'm interested in as well. Uh, farmers collect a lot of data each year, but don't always analyze it to make decisions. Um, I'm sure you guys have never seen that, but uh, what is the easiest way for an operation with standard uh, technology, GPS, planning maps, yield maps, VRT, et cetera, uh, to maximize the value of their investment? Honestly, the biggest thing is a lot of guys are recording it. They just really don't know where to go with it. 
And so if you, if you have an operation that where you're collecting all that information, just keeping it organized and putting it somewhere where you can actually look at it and utilize it. Now, I think the next step, you know, is, is working with a partner that can help you monetize and look at that data and help you make decisions in the future and how to like maximize every acre. I think the first big step is when we walk into farms and we talk to these guys, like, yeah, I have all this information, but I don't know what to do with it. Like, well, hey, let's let's use it to make fertilizer decisions and your new variable seeding racks. And we can really define and, and promote as a new nitrogen prescription to, to maximize the value on your farm. So there's a lot there. But I think the first step is admitting you have a problem, right? And thinking about, I need to start capturing my data, saving it and putting it in a place where I need to and making sure I have a partner that we have the same co-aligned values we're headed. And Ben, ben might have a comment on that too. Yeah, I would just chime in with, I, I think that the easiest option is you become an advanced agrolytics customer. <laughs> and, and, and I say that kind of jokingly, but, but really, I think what we see when you think of the persona of the growers we work with, we have very large growers and we have growers that aren't that large. And it's more of their own mindset, a certain amount of humility to say, you know what, it's not my core competency. I don't know what I don't know. And I know that what I know today won't be enough for tomorrow. And so I'm going to partner with somebody else who that is their core competency. And, and I mean, that goes along with exactly what Kent was saying. And, and that's where we can come in as a resource. We're not a full-time resource. Our resource is shared across many growers. And we can actually help them then start making a, a multi-year journey uh, to turn that data, uh, as, as Kent said, and to monetize, monetize that data into, into additional value. Great, great answer. Yeah, it's, I always say paralysis by over analysis, you know, there's so much data out there and, and where do you start? So I'm sure by bringing in a, a partner, you know, or somebody to help you digest that, that data uh, is very insightful. So we'll move forward with one more question. Um, I'll, I'll ask John a question. And that, uh, that is, how does the volatility in the weather today compare to 40 years ago? And is it more dr drastic and volatile? Or is it just brave, portrayed that way to create climate action? That's a great question. Um, I, you know, there, there's a little bit of both going on, if you ask me, I, I try to shoot it pretty straight when it comes to this question. Um, I think there's definitely a little bit of uh, overreaction. Uh, and a little bit of, of panic induced uh, by the changes that are going on uh, with the climate. That being said, I think there is also quite a bit of volatility going on with the weather. We know more about the weather now than we ever have. Um, even if you look back 10, 20 years ago, the observations that we have now, the, the ability to uh, understand what's going on in every um, facet of the atmosphere, um, the ability for weather models to forecast down to a single thunderstorm. Uh, it's, it's, it's incredible how far we've come. That also comes with a lot of responsibility and a lot of communication um, responsibility on the meteorology side, because we're, we know more now, we're learning more, we're seeing more about what's going on. There are things that might have not ever been uh, understood before. And so I think it's a little bit of both. The patterns are definitely more volatile. We're seeing more flooding, uh, definitely more ups and downs, uh, bigger cold snaps, larger storms. That's almost certainly happening. But there are also other things that you are happening that are kind of in the other direction, right? We're seeing Tornado Alley move around. There's been less tornado activity that, in certain areas than there used to be. Um, colder air is coming into areas that you didn't before. So I think it's a little bit of both uh, to answer the question directly. Um, there's a little bit of both going on. And it's up to us uh, as meteorologists really to, to kind of do our best to communicate what's happening in a very digestible and understandable way. Um, it doesn't do anyone any good to go, you know, really far in either direction. What we have to do is explain what's happening and, and try to do our best to get out ahead of it so that we can make smart business decisions uh, and understand what, what the forecast holds in the, in the months, years, and even decades that lie ahead. Yeah, thank you, John. And it looks like we've we've ran about eight minutes over our time, so that's uh, that's a good thing. And I appreciate all of our our listeners who have have hung with us. Uh, but to be cognizant of everybody's time, we're going to cut it there. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers. You know, we, it was great having you guys, and uh, a lot of a lot of good information here today. And then thank you everyone for joining. Um, we, we really enjoyed hosting it. Uh, this is our fifth big questions in land management. We try to do one each uh, fall and each spring. 
and just cover a lot of macro topics. So this, uh, this presentation will be available uh, here in the coming days on our website at peoplescompany.com. And uh, I believe we'll have uh, opportunities to share slide decks as well. Um, so tune in next time. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you again for joining us. And thanks to all the speakers for their time.